whenever you're ready. May it please the court, counsel. I'm Matthew Kachurgis on behalf of petitioner Adam Shepard. Present with me is Jesse Wilkerson at counsel table. The issue in this case is controlled by this court's prior decision in State v. Halk as reaffirmed in State v. Burris, as well as the rule of lenity codified at section 775.021. The issue being whether the court can allow reclassification of a felony offense for use of a weapon when the alleged weapon is an automobile. Petitioner contends it cannot. Whether a particular object is considered a weapon is to be determined by the trial court in the first instance. Where does that, where does that principle come from? Halk. Okay, where did that, where did Halk get it? I don't believe it, it, it states where it comes from, but the Halk well, doesn't. Then, then they quote the district court. The Enbank Fifth District right. Court of Appeal. Yes, sir. And there, but there's really no, um, there's no other authority that we have that establishes that point, is there? Burris that reaffirms that principle. Well, the, it says, then the, the Fifth District panel of uh, en banc decision says, because it says uh, firearm or weapon, so it uses that principle that I can never pronounce, a eustrum. Eustrum generis. Uh, to say that. I guess my question here about who determines it, the jury instruction that was given is a bro so broad, not whether it was intended to be, is this any object that could be used to cause death or serious injury? Was, I assume that jury instruction was objected to. Yes, we, there was an objection to um, did, did to you, the Is that weapon. a standard jury instruction? I don't recall as I sit here. I think it was pulled from I, I, either aggravated battery or some other statute is, is my recollection. Well, is the definition of what a weapon is, does it vary from statute to statute? In other words, there are some statutes that deal with exclusively firearms, others that deal with weapons. Is there any place where the legislature uses uh, the broadest term? Because again, this could, weapon could be an either or, right? If it, there are some there are definitions that say exactly that, an object that could be used to cause uh, serious injury or it, an instrument of attack uh, in defense and combat as a gun or a sword. So is there any uh, place where the legislature has indicated its intention to use the broadest possible definition of weapon, which would virtually take any case, the way I see it, of manslaughter, involuntary or voluntary manslaughter, and whatever was used would then be uh, elevated to the first degree. I mean, they would, I can't think of anything that wouldn't, if you're using it, it's a weapon. Uh, That's the problem, Your Honor. But back to your question. But is, I'm asking, is there any statutes that take a narrow, you know, that look at it, where we look at other definitions of weapon? I, I don't know that it's going to be of any aid to the court, but in the Florida Criminal Code, when you look at the chapter dealing with weapons and firearms, Chapter 790, there's a prefatory definition, I think it's 790.01, that talks about uh, dirks, billy clubs, swords, knives, but then it has the caveat on the end of it, or any other, I forget if it uses the term object, that could be used to inflict serious bodily harm or death. Well, as we, we sit here today, we now know that, as the court has pointed out, virtually any object that, that would constitute the mechanism of death would be considered the, could be considered a weapon. So yeah, what is it the way, but, but okay, okay, isn't that the way our law has treated this in many different contexts? For many, for many, many years, where we have, uh, where we, and we have opinions that are quite recent, where we refer to a hammer, uh, for instance, as a weapon, um, or we refer to. And there's a case going back to the to the uh, uh, 1870s where the court decided that a uh, weighted scale was a weapon. We have a we have a case from 1926 or 27 where we specifically held that a um, uh, automobile was a deadly weapon. 
Uh, so throughout our jurisprudence, we have uh, the use of the term weapon um, in ways that are just inconsistent with the narrow uh, construction of that term that was adopted in Hauk. Now, whether Hauk is right or wrong on the ultimate issue there, I mean, that's a different question. But we're, fo we're focusing on the reasoning that they use, which limited the definition. But isn't it true that that's kind of, Hauk is there really very much in tension with a lot of different things that are in our case law, including case law that has, has come after Hauk. The only situations where I've seen that applied were, in a, and it seems to be an anomaly, and I have no explanation on why the divide in the law is the way it is on this, but for aggravated battery and aggravated assault, they've allowed the, the automobile to be used as a weapon. In every other context, you're in specifically the reclassification statute, 775.087, it is given the definition of its plain and ordinary meaning as divine from the dictionary. Well, but, you, but, but I, I've got a problem with that because if we look at Webster's dictionary, which, you know, Webster's Third International, would you believe me if I told you that in Webster's <laughs> Third International it says weapon applies to anything used or usable in injuring, destroying, or defeating an enemy or opponent? I would not be surprised, but in another, in another dictionary, it, um, states an instrument used for combat, such as a sword or a gun. And How about yet, Black's dictionary, which says, the legal dictionary, which says an instrument used or designed to be used to injure or kill someone. So if it's used to kill someone, according to Black's, it's a weapon according to blacks. However, this court has already determined that that broad sweeping definition cannot be applied. And well, further, what, what, let me ask you this, uh, dealing with the broad sweeping definition that's been discussed, uh, uh, manslaughter was the original charge, the underlying charge here, am I correct? No, first degree murder. First degree murder? So the jury came back with Indictment. manslaughter? Correct. Okay, that, that was the verdict, manslaughter, and then he, it was aggravated to... It was enhanced under the statute for murder. use of the weapon. So, one can commit manslaughter by hitting someone with their fist. So sure. uh, you, you read of cases every day where somebody gets in a fist fight, he gets hit in the face, the guy falls, hits his head on the pavement, dies. Uh, so that's manslaughter. So wh why is, what is wrong with a jurisprudence that would allow an enhancement when something other than the fist is used. If, if there's a fist fight and I pick up a rock, I pick up uh, whatever is available to me at the moment and hit them, uh, why not enhance it with that? Because the rule of lenity precludes that. Mm -hmm. Uh, the rule of lenity that if a statute is subject uh, to ambiguity is to be construed in a manner most favorable to the defense. It would also lead to absurd results. Let's take Halk, for instance. The gentleman, the defendant in that case, was accused of, of homicide, I think it was manslaughter, by pounding a gentleman's um, head into the pavement. And the, this court found that the pavement could not be considered a weapon. Let's take that analogy. Someone beats, uh, a defendant beats uh, a victim's head into a brick wall. Under the same analysis in Hauk, that brick wall could not be considered a weapon. Well, but can't you make a distinction there just based on the, the understanding of what weapon means, based on what Webster says and the blacks and a multitude of dictionaries, um, where, where the the uh, connotation is that a weapon is something that the person employing the weapon controls in some manner. You wield a weapon, you control it. Um, so you, you can wield a hammer, you can, uh, you can uh, I think you can wield a car, okay? You can control that. Um, but you can't wield the ground. You can't wield or control a tree. And so it's just, the, that can't be, that doesn't fit within the, the ordinary sense of what a weapon would be. 
Isn't that, isn't that a way to distinguish those? And okay, you may say, well, maybe we should also pun punish uh, those equivalently, but if the legislature has used weapon, they've used the term weapon. And we are limited by what the legislature has said. And in this case, if we were to engraft these more expansive de definitions of the term weapon, I, I would contend that that's legislating from the bench because the legislature used the term weapon. Halk was decided well, in 1995. But, when, they, but when, when, the, when, when the legislature, when did they, when did they uh, adopt that term in the legislature? Do you know? I was looking back through the legislative history on some of this stuff, and I know that the, the deadly weapon enhancement for armed robbery came in in 74, I believe. Okay, so that's before how. How is obviously in How 95. It's sometime prior okay. to 95. But now, when the legislature used that, wouldn't the legislature have had the benefit of cases like Williamson's versus State and this whole body of law that we have in Florida? <laughs> where objects that are not designed for the purpose of uh, injuring or killing someone have been referred to as weapons when they are put to the use of injuring or killing someone. That, you know, there's a principle of law that, that, that the legislature, if, if, there's, if, if our case law has used a term in a particular way, then that is going to inform our interpretation of the way the legislature subsequently uses it. Uh, now, other things can come into play, but why wouldn't we consider that when we actually look at what the legislature, that term that they used? Because when the court announced Halk in 95, it stated that the court was not in a position to adopt the, the definition well, advanced by the, the I, state. Let me, let me and concede. invited the legislature I think, to, to I amend think it. to disagree with you we would have to receive from Halk. I will, I will concede that. But I think what is at issue in this case, really, is whether we should do that, not necessarily on the result reached in Halk, but on the reasoning employed in Halk. And in, in determining the, what is the definition of weapon, assuming the court's prepared to recede from Halk, you're looking at the plain and ordinary meaning. And in this case, the definition of weapon is susceptible to differing meanings just by evidence of the, of the conflict of the districts in this case, with Gonzalez in the second, this case in the first, the opinion of Herbert out of the fifth, there's different constructions of what the term weapon means. Indeed, the first district in this case says that Gonzalez interpretation is a reasonable construction. So if you have reasonable interpretations that are totally different about what this term means, the rule of lenity favors Shepard. It has to be construed in the narrow manner as it let, is let a- Let me ask you this, how does that rule apply if there is a common understanding of a word and an uncommon definition as well. I mean, don't, don't we apply the common understanding of a word and assume that that's what the legislature meant when it used the word? And, and I would contend that when you think of the common... I mean, isn't that a principle of law? That, that you, you assume that the legislature used a word in the way that it's commonly understood? It's plain and ordinary meaning. I mean, I, yes, okay. 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 Um, I now, would agree. A, a, co a common understanding, if, if I, someone takes a baseball bat to a fight and beats someone with it, common understanding, would that be a weapon? It's an interesting question because if is it the question, is a baseball bat a weapon in isolation? No, no. Or is a baseball bat used to inflict harm in a fight a weapon? I mean, common understanding, if I said, um, what weapon did he use? He used a baseball bat. W would the listener go, well, that, no, that, that, that's not a weapon. Would they use the unusual definition? Well, the usual definition of a baseball bat is a device designed to hit baseballs. The usual definition of a weapon is what we're talking about, and that's a, a, an object used to inflict injury, right? Yes, a knife, a sword, a dirk, a billy club, black brass knuckles, all of those things would fall so within the under, end. So under your unusual definition, a billy club would be a weapon, but a baseball bat would not. Yes. I have so a, in all the cases where we have said that, the, um, that someone used uh, a hammer or a uh, baseball bat or some other object like that, not designed to uh, uh, inflict uh, harm on others, but used for the purpose of doing that, 
that we've somehow been misusing the term weapon when we refer to those items as weapons. I, I'm reluctant to say that because I don't know whether defense counsel raised the issue below. Just I to, don't know if it was ever presented in those contexts, and it may have been that everyone just assumed that that was a weapon without challenging the premise of the of the. I want to talk issue. about just the practical effect of this. As you say, the jury was, well, the defendant was charged with first degree premeditated murder. Correct. So he could have gotten a life sentence, and then the issue life. of whether it was a car or a bat or a gun would have been murder. less would have been irrelevant. Likewise, second degree murder, Circuit punishable would by have been life, a, a, would have been a first degree felony, punishable by life. And he, there would have been no reason. So now we go back to me, and this is what I'd like the state to talk about. This is a reclassification statute. It's not whether a crime was committed. The effect of where I hear my colleagues going is really other than if it's a pavement or a brick wall that every involuntary or voluntary manslaughter second degree will be reclassified as a first degree felony. That is and what is the difference in the uh, punishment for the, the first degree felony can get up to what? 30 years. Second degree? 15. Okay, and here he was sentenced consecutively, right? So well, it's, there's the leaving the scene of a crash right, involving so that, death. There's that no was, issue there. Okay, no, so it's but a, this court, the court took the manslaughter finding, used the enhancement, took a secondary felony, enhanced him to a first, and maxed him out with 30 years. And in justice, in your, in your contention, that's the concern, the Pandora's box that gets opened by this expansive. Well, I, but why is that a Pandora's box? I don't. I don't I, I, that that escapes me. If someone uses an instrument. As a weapon, why shouldn't it be enhanced? I mean, there's kind of the assumption that that's a, that that is opening a Pandora's box is, is seems to me to be um, just kind of a rhetorical point, not a legal point. But it, it would run contrary to what this court has found the legislative intent of the enactment of this statute is is to in how in how to, to preclude persons from bringing items commonly understood to be weapons, firearms, knives, and the like, to scenes of the crime, to avoid the enhancement of the harm that would happen in, in these situations. And it's the province of the legislature to make those determinations. Let me ask you this. So if, if you're, just as a pure matter of statutory construction, um, if you're right that when the legislature uses the term weapon, it has two reasonable constructions or meanings, and we have to apply the rule of lenity don't we then need to recede from the cases that say that a weapon is anything used to inflict injury? I mean, wouldn't... I don't, that issue is not presented in the court. Right, but to I'm this asking court, you Because we're dealing with the reclassification statute, not aggravated T battery, tell me how, not how aggravated you, assault. Tell me how you would distinguish it. I mean, we, we have... As I viewed it, I have not seen a case where a defendant has raised the use of uh, the improper use of a deadly weapon in just those two statutes. That is the only cases I see where that issue has gone unanalyzed: un aggravated battery and aggravated assault. So I don't know that it's presently a. But problem I mean, there's nothing the in the text of the statutes that would lead you to conclude that weapon means one thing in this statute and another thing in the battery statutes, right? I can't divine any. I don't know why that schism exists. Well, but shouldn't our law be coherent? Should it be? Theoretically, yes. Well, I mean, that's sort of, I think that that's an issue here because of all this other stuff out there where we use this term weapon in a sense that's inconsistent with the way it was understood and how. Well, I and that seems to me to be a problem. Maybe it's, maybe it's resolved in your favor, uh, but some other things are going to have to go that are out there in the case law, ultimately, if our law is going to be coherent. I would think so, that these issues may arise in the aggravated battery and aggravated assault context when a, a traditional weapon is not used. If I were to have a case like that today, I know I'd be raising it. And, I, and to, to your, your Honor's uh, point, I don't know that any of the cases addressing aggravated battery or aggravated assault and non-traditional weapons have ever engaged in that analysis. It's always been an assumption. An analysis of what? Whether the device used in oh, the harm well, was you a haven't weapon. read Williamson then, have you? Well, it's an automobile. I know that. Well, but that was the whole argument there, is whether that could be considered a weapon. And it was extensively... Uh, uh, and there's an extensive analysis uh, um, uh, 
in, in that case about uh, that looked over the case law that said we had previously decided that um, and they, we, we quote a, another court where it said the deadly weapon is not is not one that must kill or that may kill but the one which would likely produce death or great bodily injury used by the defendant in the manner in which it was used. Well, and then we talk about somebody, uh, a large stick may constitute a deadly weapon, and on and on and on, um, going to uh, case law that, of ours and case from, from other states, and then we ultimately conclude that yes, an automobile can be a deadly weapon. But it wasn't a manslaughter finding. So the, the intent of the defendant may be different in Williamson because he intended to run the gentleman over with a car, where here the jury returned a verdict of manslaughter. Well, where they the returned a verdict of manslaughter with a specific finding of manslaughter with a weapon. Now, I agree. I agree with you that the, if, an, if an item is not a, um, uh, uh, something that's designed to inflict harm, but simply used to inflict harm, that there's a kind of, you've got to have some intent. Uh, for instance, if you, if you um, negligently, culpably, but negligently drop a hammer out a window and it lands on somebody's head, now even though a hammer could, could be used as a weapon, it wouldn't be a weapon in that context. Uh, but here, the jury made the specific finding that it was with a weapon. Isn't that but correct? The, you, the, really haven't, you haven't focused on challenging that. Well, based upon the de definition that they were given by the trial court, that anything could be used as a weapon if it could inflict serious bodily harm or, or death. Anything could be used as a weapon. Throwing a toaster into a bathtub, the toaster now becomes a weapon. Anything could be used as a weapon under the, the mm -hmm. formulation uh, in the jury instructions by the trial court. And that's the problem with this. It is just grossly overbroad if, if the court were to adopt the state's construction. I'm well into my rebuttal time, and unless there's another question, I'll reserve. I'll give you a couple of minutes rebuttal. May it please the court, Caitlin Weiss for the Office of the Attorney General for the state. Um, Your Honors, it's the state's position that the reclassification statute and the language in Huck supports the state's interpretation of this statute that the use of a weapon should determine what is a weapon in you a crime. You agree that for this case, that the jury instruction said simply, any object that could be used to cause death or serious injury. Um, yes, that okay. sounds right. And they rejected first degree murder. Yes and second degree murder. So they went to manslaughter and they don't differentiate whether it was involuntary or voluntary. So under the scenario that uh, Justice Kennedy asked the, uh, your opposing counsel, if somebody culpably threw a object, any object, out of the window without looking at who was underneath and that person was killed, whatever that object was, whether there was intent or not, would qualify as a weapon. I think that the incredibly important distinction to make here in cases of culpable negligence are that an item would only be a weapon if it was used as a weapon. So if you're tossing a toaster any out. object that could be used. So that really to me, that definition, I think that's which is now a, was a jury finding, not a judge finding, was as broad as really any, I guess, non-passive object, anything, whether it's a hammer, a toaster, a whatever. The question of the intent goes to whether it was in, involuntary manslaughter, voluntary manslaughter, uh, second degree murder, or first degree murder. And that's where the intent comes in. As I said, it doesn't really matter if, if they fi found him guilty of first degree murder it was a car, nobody's arguing. So my concern is, after this decision, the reclassification becomes automatic if we allow this definition for anything except for passive objects. Would you agree with that? I would not, and again, I- What would I, be excluded? I think that it would, I know this is a court of policy, but I think that many of, much of this would have to be fact specific. And I think that an object that was not used as a weapon in a conflict could not be enhanced well, what under would this be statute. The, because then the whole thing is, and this is a question of what the legislature intended, 
We said it was to provide harsher punishment and hopefully deter those persons who use instruments commonly recognized, commonly recognized as having the purpose to inflict death and bodily serious injury. Now, I don't know if that we got that out of nowhere or that was there when the statute was passed as the legislative intent, but it seems to me most respectfully to you, my colleagues, the first district, that what we're really doing is deciding something the legislature never decided, which is this term is so broad to really encompass anything other than a passive object. Well, I think that this court, if you look at the third footnote in Burris, this court has previously acknowledged that the definition made of weapon or the way the statute was constructed is enormously broad, and it's purposefully broad. You know, this statute uses broad language to define well, using a weapon and broad language to define what can be a well, weapon. The use, language in the statute is and, and in Burris, didn't we specifically make uh, a reference in a footnote to this Williamson case that talks about the automobile being a deadly weapon. Let's look at the, uh, the, uh, the toaster example used by counsel. It's one thing, I mean, there are some people who are kind of strange, and I guess they toast their toasts and while they're taking a bath. Um, uh, so if it happens to drop in there and something happens, obviously, uh, you know, the, the, the intent is not there to commit harm. Uh, however, if somebody purposefully throws you know, a, a toaster in a bathtub when somebody's taking a, a bath, obviously the intent, the use of the weapon changes. Precisely. It's being used with a man. So that's the thinking. Same thing with an automobile. I mean, no one in their right mind today can deny that cars are not being used as weapons to kill people. We turn the TV on every day and see that. Uh, so uh, that's foolish. Uh, however, if he drove the car that night, not intending to hit this guy, but, you know, in, in, in trying to get away from him or something, uh, hit him without the intent to kill him uh, or, or, or do, you know, harm, that's a different matter. It's how the, how the weapon is used. And that's got to be the intent of the legislature here in this instance. So if I'm the sentencing judge and the jury finds that a weapon was used and the jury was instructed that the, jury, the weapon is, was used with the intent to commit harm, uh, or something like that, then, you know, enhancement is appropriate. Uh, whether it's a rock, whether it's, a, you know, if somebody drops, if I'm a, a roofer, we had a roofing case here earlier. Let me just make something interesting out of it. But uh, let's say a roofer drops a hammer from the roof and it lands on some poor guy walking underneath, uh, picking up debris, uh, that, the intent is not there to enhance the sentence. Uh, however, if he picks up the hammer and throws it at him, that's another thing. That's what we got to can't lose common sense here. You've summarized my position, Admiral. Except that your position is fine. Except that the jury instruction didn't say that the uh, weapon was the object that was intended to be used. I might agree with that being let's, at least an interim definition. You let, me, let me help you there. The, the jury instruction reads like this. If you find that Shepard committed manslaughter and you find beyond a reasonable doubt that during the commission of the crime he personally used, threatened to use or attempted to use a weapon, you should find him guilty of manslaughter. And then it goes on, it defines weapon and the definition that we read, and then says, if you find that he committed manslaughter but did not use a weapon, so you, use is in the standard instructions, correct? Yes, it is. So it, 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 they're not asked to find whether an automobile is a weapon, they're asked to find whether he used a weapon, right? Correct, that's okay. exactly And the, I'm pretty right. confident these are the standard instructions, right? I believe that they are. And we um, have cases as early as this year unanimously saying that that's the correct legal definition of weapon in Florida, correct? Yes, and I would also again point to the fact that this verdict form contained a specific interrogatory of if he used a weapon, and the jury made the finding that a weapon was used in this case. Um, so I think that although I do agree with Justice Lawson that the definition uh, that the jury instructions were given were sufficient, they were also specifically asked 
was this used? Was, and they answered uh, yes. Uh, about this uh, jury instruction, uh, I assume that uh, uh, the defendant's attorney requested a different instruction about the definition of a weapon? Um, I, I believe it was objected to the, the fact that a car was a weapon. Uh, putting that in the instruction at all was objected to. I can't recall if they requested something different. Uh, and was that, was this particular jury instruction, which defines a weapon, was that an issue that was raised on appeal? On the appeal to, uh, what is this, the fourth district? The first district. First district. Um, I, I believe that it was because the issue of car as a weapon was appealed to, to the first. But I, I understand that that issue was, but I'm talking about the specific jury instruction that defines what a weapon is. Was no. that a separate issue that was raised on appeal? No, I don't believe that I've ever seen anything in this case challenging the specific jury instruction used. Let, let, let me ask you this. The, the other, I, I think the problem, other problematic part of Hauk is that it treats this as an issue of law. And if you use a use definition, necessarily doesn't that have to be an issue of fact? I think it does. And I think that treating it as an issue of fact would go some way towards hopefully alleviating Justice Perriente's concerns about items being automatically classified as a weapon. When you take into an ac account the intent with which things were used and the facts surrounding the use of an object, you uh, hopefully eliminate a lot of the fear of kind of automatic enhancement. So you would then, even whether this the definition of weapon is part of the standard jury instructions or not, if we decide to receive from Hauk and say this is an issue of fact for the jury, then would it be, would you agree that it should be defined to mean any object that was intended to, to be used to cause death or uh, inflict serious bodily injury? Yes, any object that was intentionally used okay. as a weapon. Okay, but that was not, whether it was, again, we'll see if it was objected to, but that's not what the jury instruction in this case uh, provided. And the jury in this case, though, did make the finding, the specific finding I think is so important here, that he did use a weapon. But we know he, if they, but if they're given a definition that a weapon is anything that could be used to cause death, then whether it's a hammer, a toaster, a rock, or a car, it's a, it, that defin, it becomes an automatic finding. The use then is supplemental. I, there wasn't a separate finding. Was the automobile in this case intended to be used to cause death because, again, the jury did reject first-degree murder and second-degree murder, which, you know, under the facts of the case was a pretty uh, credible result, it seems, for the defense lawyer because the facts would seem to support a higher level. So, you know, we're not talking about these are not great facts for the defendant, it seems to me, but there's no, there's no separate finding. Was this automobile intended to be used cause intent. And we don't know because it's either voluntary or involuntary. If it was found to be voluntary manslaughter, we'd have a finding of intent. Well, I, the, the specific finding that the jury made in this case m exactly mirrors the language in the reclassification statute. So they checked the box that said, we find the defendant used, threatened to use, or attempted to use a weapon during the commission of the offense. I. But they've all, but they haven't found the weapon was the definition that we just used, which is anything that could be used to inflict death without regard to intent. But I think the, I think that the facts in this case don't support any anything else. I mean, the facts in this case that the defendant, you know, flicked his lights, lured the victim there, deliberately ran him over. The photographs put into evidence by the state showed a fairly wide area that he could have, if he was trying to get away, could have maneuvered his car. I mean, the facts were strongly in support of, you know, not only a higher offense, but also of manslaughter by act. And I think the finding that he used the weapon is sufficient in this case to justify the reclassification, the fact that the jury specifically made that finding. If there are no other questions, thank you. Okay, counsel, the 
two minutes, please. With respect to Justice Quince's question about an objection to the language of the instruction, there was no objection raised with respect to its language. The objection was lodged to the inclusion of weapon in the jury instructions, period, that it just shouldn't be in there. It didn't go down the path of the language that was thereafter employed. And, and nothing, uh, was o nothing was offered when the, the objection was overruled, I guess. Uh, the defense didn't attempt to offer any other definition. No, but the defense's position that there was no weapon entailed and that that was error by the trial court. Getting back to Judge Justice Kennedy's position on the dichotomy of the longstanding law where other objects have been considered deadly weapons, in Burris this court noted, we do not question that automobiles have, held, have been held to be deadly weapons in other criminal statutes. However, both the language used and the nature of the underlying offenses punished by those statutes clearly permit such an interpretation. Here, this case is different for the reasons that Justice Perriente has pointed out. Well, but what they're talking about in, in Burris, they're talking about whether an automobile can be carried. Okay, that was what was at issue there. Well, they, they uh, and so I mean, you've got to look at everything they say in the context of that. And I think Burris was absolutely right. I will say that right here in, in uh, deciding that uh, an automobile cannot be carried um, as a weapon. Um, it may carry uh, a person. I think it can. I think. Arguably, the issue here is can it be used as a weapon, but being carried as a weapon is a far, is a far different thing. And, and Burris, that's its fundamental and its narrow holding, but it goes on to talk in larger scope about the nature of what is a weapon. And in this case, the nature of the underlying offense, the jury returned a verdict for manslaughter. There was no intent to kill. There's been no finding of, by the jury whether he intended to use, Shepard intended to use this as a weapon or not. And, and given that, that posture of the case, you can't conclude that he intended to use it as a weapon. And the definition that was given to the jury by the court, a weapon is legally defined to mean any object that could be used but, but, to but cause your, death. But your argument here is not about the sufficiency of the jury finding. Your whole argument is they should that have, an automobile cannot be a weapon. Yeah, and it should it's have been. whole definitional. So you, you have not made an alternative argument about, well, even if it could be, then this, this finding this jury finding wasn't sufficient, didn't have sufficient findings of intent to use it as a weapon. That's not part of your argument. No, our right? argument is that it should have never been submitted to the jury. I understand. Thank you for your arguments. Of course, in recess until tomorrow. All right.